Welcome to uh, sensors part. Well, how do you say this? I already put a video out about sensors, but we're actually going to take a step back. So this would be part minus one. Okay, doesn't matter. Let's move forward. So the purpose of this first video that I'm doing, that's actually the second video. So if you saw the first one, that'll make sense. But um, when I go to label it and retitle it, I'm going to change the title to uh, part two. So this being part one, I want to address sensors. Now, the reason why I'm doing that is because when I published that first video, I got a lot of questions and it really began to hit me that I had narrowed my view very small. The reason being was I'm building a layout and I pretty much when I write and do a video, it's about what I'm working on and what I can share that might be helpful to someone else. So in that case, taking a look at the comments, I all of a sudden realized, wow, I narrowed down too, too tight and I needed to expand. So I'm taking a step back and try and share what it is that I want to do and share with these videos. Sensors are what we use to determine where a train is at. Why is that important? Why do we even care? Why are we doing that? Well, my props are falling down. In any case, that's where I'm going to start this video at. Why is it that I care where a train is at? Well, let's be fair about it. In today's hobby, everybody builds a control panel. And the purpose of a control panel is what? Turn switches, change signals, control the train, right? Well, part of that might be knowing where the train is at. So I'm going to start this from the position of the purpose of sensors is to add something to your control panel that you may need. So let's take a look at what a control panel can be. A good friend of mine, Mike Whiteman, excellent modeler. This is from his old O scale layout. This is an example of a control panel. Fancy looking, isn't it? Mike does some excellent work. It's a little dusty because, well, Mike's layout here, this particular layout doesn't exist anymore. That's the reason why I have these control panels. But nonetheless, this is Mike's turnout controls. These are his signal controls down to here, and these are the codex buttons. I forget what these other buttons are, but you can see the track diagram up here. Now Mike's layout was a simple half a garage stall layout that he basically built a circle that he could run his O scale layout and do some switching and run some trains. And that's what this was for. So Mike really didn't need necessarily sensors to determine where the train is at. But if you're building a bigger layout, you might need that. Here's another example of Mike's panels that he built. This is another one, and you can see, again, the same type of pattern that he did. Turnouts here, signals here, codex buttons down here. And again, I forget, Mike will probably correct me somewhere along the line and remind me what ABC stands for. But I, I do know that ABC st does match for this. In this case here, I think the ABC has a lot to do with the fact that he's got a Y here, which is basically a reverse loop. So, in any case, let's take a look at what Mike had to do. As you can see, Mike is a very good electrician. And he understands all these rotary switches and how to make them, wire them all together. And then he had them attached to signals that did all that type of work. I'm not against that. I actually liked those. Those were really, really cool when Mike built those. But I'm dealing with a larger layout and I don't want to go through all the effort to do that and quite frankly, that's a little intimidating for me. I understand this much better than I do that. But the other method you might do a panel with is a digital like I'm doing. And here's an example of a digital panel. As you can see, this is my panel from uh, the Colorado Front Range and what I'm doing in JMRI. So the purpose of sensors in our application here is to determine where a train is on the track. It may be in a helix and I need to be able to know where it's at spinning up the helix 
or it might be in a block or somewhere where I can't see it. It's in hidden track. Or maybe I want to know where to stop that train that's in a hidden track so it doesn't foul a switch or doesn't go beyond a certain point. We can use sensors to determine those things. JMRI is a panel design system. The Panel Pro is an example of a panel, a digital panel control system. The needs for the two of them are a little different. In the case of where we're dealing with what we're going to call a hard panel or an analog panel, I need to light up an LED somehow or I need to light up a light bulb. That means I need between 4 to 12 volts roughly to light up something and a lot of the, the designs that Jeff Bunza has put out in Model Railroad Hobbyist, matter of fact I showed one in that first video, is designed to light up an LED. It's going to throw about 4 volts of power on the output signal so you could stick it on your panel and light it up. You can use different types of signals too. If you want to use a little the old style bezel lights that used to use a 12 volt light bulb, you can use those on your panel and you can use a 12 volt power to charge that up. And that's what I'm going to do. Is I'm going to show you different options of what you can use to make your panels, whether it's digital or analog. And that's what the purpose of this video is. That was what I originally set out to do, only I got too narrow and it was only focusing on JMRI and the digital side of what I was going to do. The other question that came up in, in from the second video, which is the first video that I put out there, I got a lot of questions about where do I get this stuff and how do I do it. As I just stated, Jeff has done a lot and Jeff Bunza is absolutely First of all, it's Dr. Jeff Bunza, and he's an electrical engineer. Right away, let me just tell you, the man is a genius, okay? He's designed a lot of these circuits, and he's there on Model Railroad Hobbyist blog. If you've got a question, shoot him a message. He does look at it. He listens to him. He answers questions where he can. He's very approachable, and if you have a question, he will help you. Let me tell you what, I started this project and in the middle of doing this project, I realized there was two things that I had failed in what I wanted to accomplish. I shot Jeff an email and right away he got back to me and said, well, Mike, this is what I'm looking for. And it helped me immensely and it also opened my eyes up to what everybody else in the hobby is doing. And that's what I want to do is share with that with you. So if you're going to work in an analog or you're going to work in a digital, this video series is going to help you get to that and get accomplished the goal that you want to do to make the panel that you want to see. So, I'm not going to show you how to build a panel. I'm not going to show you how to make a panel. I've done a video on JMRI making a panel. There are plenty of videos out there already for making an analog panel and plenty of examples out there. What you probably more of a question is, how do I get a sensor to trip a light on an analog panel or a digital panel. And that's what this video is going to be about. How can I get that accomplished? So from there, that's what we're going to do. So hang on, we're going to start these videos and we're going to start again and get caught up. So from here, let's get started. Okay, so we're going to try and go through different sensors as a whole and then we'll kind of tie it all together. This is my test track and, and all the, the different components that we'll be using. We're going to start from some really easy ones uh, and this is probably the simplest one I have found to do. Um, these are Arduino RFD sensors. Um, I have one set up right here. Um, they come in, I bought these, they're about a buck a piece. Dirt cheap. Got them on Amazon. And this is what it looks like. And you've probably seen that a lot of folks are using these. So I'm going to use it in a non Arduino situation here. And this will work whether you're using DCC or DC. It doesn't matter. Uh, basically, what it is is this little sensor here just detects 
if there's an RFD signal, or, or I mean, some, and something reflecting back the, the um, infrared signal. So I have it set up high. You could set it underneath the track, but because of my test situation, this is probably the easiest way for me to set it up and kind of go through how it would work. Now, if you're sitting in a staging yard, this type of position where it's sitting up high, fine, it works. I mean, there's no reason that you have to bury it under the track if you got room. It doesn't have great range. That is a downside of it, but it is significant enough to do to work with it. Now, this works with its, when it's not active, it is in a high state. In other words, it takes five volts. So what I've got is, let me kind of go through what I've got here. So I got a 12 volt power supply coming into here. And then it, it's going into a, a simple buckboard that's just reducing this down to five volts, actually 4.8 volts. Um, and then it's going through my breadboard so I can get it to both the sensor and to my LED. Now the reason why I say that this is a high board is if you can take a look here, you can see, uh, maybe you can't, this LED is lit. It's red. It's a red LED and it's lit. There's nothing in front of it and it's lit. Now as the car moves in front of it, it goes out. So, and as it moves away, it comes back on. So this is a real simple sensor. I've got no technology in here other than just five volts feeding into the sensor and then the ground and the out going to the LED. Now, I'm going to give you a couple things about this. This sensor normally picks up real close when you're nearby, but because I have an LED on the end, it says, hey, I detect something. It's because it's the feedback that's coming back for it. This is not exactly how this was designed to work, but it functions and it works just fine. So if you want a simple, uh, simple system that has no connections whatsoever, you can do this. The other thing you can do is you can find Arduino 5 volt relays. Um, and I, I use them on my staging track to turn on and off my power. And it's a 5 volt input. And it can, you can either get them with on high or on low. And you can, some of them, like the ones I have, they're, they're adjustable. I can decide which position I want it. Based on how I feed the five volts into it, that decides if it's, if I want it, like, like this one where it's, when it's detected, it goes into a low state, which would drop it onto the um, relay and fire the power. Or it could be reversed. And you can get those. Um, I've got uh, eight of those relays on a panel all ready to just simply plug in the wire just like I'm doing here. Um, I don't know, I paid 10 bucks for eight of them. So, you know, that's a buck and a quarter piece. So all said and done, you've got a power supply, which is a couple bucks, a buckboard, or if you get a five volt one, then you don't need the buckboard. So five volts going into this, going into the sensor, the sensor then feeds back to it. And if you want to use relays, you can do that. It's a simple project couple bucks and you have a few detectors. So if you're using that on your control panel, an analog control panel, there's an easy way to get lights on your panel to determine if a train is in the area. And again, you can decide to just leave it in the state it is in right now, or you could put a relay in there and it would reverse it. You make the decision. The other thing that's nice is um, I have, these are 12 volt bezels and I'll take a close photograph of these. These I used on a, on a panel I did before, an analog panel that I've done before. These are 12 volts. Um, while they won't work with this, but if you put the relay in there, you can feed 12 volts on your relay because they're, optic, they're, they're separated. That five volts is separated from the power and you can actually then drive these 12 volt LEDs that are in a bezel. I kind of like that. It was really sharp. Um, they're a little more pricier, but you know, it looked nice. So that I went with that, that solution. This does not, as you can see, as it comes in and detects it, it does not do anything. It's either on or it's off. It is a pure digital signal. It's either on or it's off. 
and that's all you're going to get out of it. It's not going to give you any delays. It's not going to detect it. And oh, by the way, if it's between cars, it can go off and on. So it's going to flicker. That's one way of doing that. The other way you could do that is we'll talk about later on, which is using an Arduino. And we'll get into using Arduinos later. The nice thing about this system is that I can actually take and take these three connections right here into the ring. And I'm just showing you this, what you can do. And I literally just plug these in exactly where they go. So voltage goes here. Ground goes here. And signal goes there. Now, if I have this wired up, it's not a problem. It'll detect it and give you a, a, a charge right there. You could then in turn feed that information to an output on the same board going to a relay to turn on and off the lights as well. You need to learn how to do some programming and I am not a programmer. I'll be the first to admit it. Matter of fact, the programming that I'm using on this one I got from Jeff Bunza. But it's not that complicated. I'm learning. I'm learning how to do it. I've done some of it in the past. I built my own um, accessory decoders and I've learned how to adjust them and, and tweak the programming and there's plenty of libraries out there so you know there's an option right there going through an Arduino and the nice thing about that is I don't have to have any of this I can actually feed my 5 volts into here and power everything right off of it or control the relays and then I can run my 12 volts to that if I want to run my 12 volt bezels or if I just want to use 5 volts I can power right off of there my suggestion though, if you're putting the relays onto this, do a separate power supply because those relays and all these sensors are gonna take a lot more amperage than you can feed through a simple USB port going through there. So just forewarn, okay? So that's one way of doing it. That's one type of sensor. The other type of sensor that I showed in the last video is these I'm trying to find one that's kind of wired up so that we can demonstrate. Oh, here we go. This is one right here. This is, and I'll put links to all these. Uh, this is a Jeff Bunza design. I'll put a link down to the bottom. This is an ambient light detector. And this, basically the 12 volts plugs into here so I could actually plug it straight into here. And I think we can do that. Just give me a second here. And I will set this up and we'll show you how it works. Okay, so for this set, I've got, this is the ambient light. And again, this can be used with DCC, non-DCC. I'm basically going to just show you what its voltage does. So, this is my ground right here. This is my power input. I'm putting 5.5 and a quarter volts into the circuit. Um, this circuit actually has two feeds and they're designed to work as ambient light. So one sits under the track and one sits as a, as a, so this is my one that's not under the track and this is my one that's under the track. And as you can see right now, my LED would be lit. When I put my hand over this, it drops down its voltage and the LED would go out. And as it come, departs, it would light back up again. Now the advantage of this is while it does pinpoint just like the other, like the infrared, it is sitting, if you had a train running over top of it where you had it in between the tracks, it would definitely block the light and you would be able to detect the whole train through that circuit. But if your block is longer than the train, like most of us that will probably be doing this type of stuff, this is not great. But I'll tell you where it is helpful. And you can do the infrared the same way. If I have a situation where like a, a light, uh, a, a uh, road crossing or something like this, this would be perfect because it would block it. And then you can put a delay on there and you could simply get that circuit to, you know, once it's tripped, it runs and then you have a two second delay that usually passes the cars through there and then it would end the thing. Or you could set up two of them and it would actually run until both of them are clear. It depends on how you decide to wire it. But you can use this as a sensor too. And as you can see, it just simply turns on and turns off. Again, because you're able to generate five volts, or if you want to, 
I could increase the voltage on this. This same circuit could run up to 912 volts and do the same thing. It's going to drop down to almost zero and come back at nine. So if you want to run a relay on this to do the same thing, you can do the exact same thing. Again, this is how you would use it in an analog. In a digital, I've been experimenting with this. This is not how Jeff originally designed it. He originally set this up to be used as a panel. I'm experimenting with getting it down, its voltage down to around, whoop, just a little too low. close to five volts and getting it to work as you can see and the advantage of that is then I can also feed that into an Arduino and it would trip it because it would be considered somewhat like a digital signal because it's dropping below the 3.7 volt threshold that it needs to turn it off and it's coming above it to create that signal so there's another one right here and this is the one I originally showed on the first video it's a very simple circuit you can buy all the components and build them yourself. Uh, these are not available in a store. You basically self-build them. And I'll point again for this circuit and the other one that I'll be showing you here, which is the, uh, the Twin T, which is an old circuit from the days of Lynn West got only modernized. Um, I'll show you how we can use that for both DC or DCC. So in any case, there's another really simple one. Again, you can set it up by LEDs or you can use it in an Arduino. A little experimenting. So hang on. We'll take a look at another one. Okay. So that concludes my testing on pinpoint sensors. And I say pinpoint sensors because those sensors can tell you at that instant in time exactly where something at. So for instance, if your block is 12 feet long and you have a six foot long train, it'll tell you maybe for six feet, but if the train passes the sensor and it stops and still is in the block, those sensors won't help you unless you have multiple sensors throughout the entire block. That's the only way that you can actually then tell if, it, if, if that is the case. Now, in, if you're doing a digital panel, you can manage that through programming, but it becomes a little more complicated. Um, you can do it easily on an analog panel if you want to just simply have multiple sensors all feeding to the same LED. They will in turn through, you know, put a resistor in there. They will in turn light up and you'll be able to tell throughout the whole thing, even if you put multiples in there. And frankly, if you're doing the, um, the uh, infrareds, I mean, at a buck a piece, that's dirt and cheap. It's really hard to argue putting, you know, three of them into a 12-foot block to manage a six-foot train, you'd be fine. But again, if you only have an engine in there and it fits in between there, it's going to slip through and it's going to be present and you're not going to have a light. So that brings us to more of a block detector. Um, now, back in the days of Lynn Westcott and... and back in the 50s, they developed a, a block sensor called a Twin T. And Jeff Bunza kind of resurrected that and modified it and updated it a bit. This is what the, what the actual um, circuitry looks like. It's right here, this, this exact same example here. Now, it works on both DC and DC, excuse me, it works in DC and DCC. It is designed for DC, and if you're in DC, this is probably a very good choice. If you're in DCC, the next example, I think, is a better choice than this one. Now, to be fair, I, I built this, um, it ran me about $12. And the example I show you next for DCC is going to cost you $14, so $2 difference. Um, but if you're doing DC, this is fantastic. Now, as I expressed earlier, I don't have DC. I just, I left DC over 20 years ago and I haven't even considered getting another tra transformer, so I don't have one. 
Um, but I will show you that this does work in DCC as well. And it will work in, in DC, the same thing occurs. Um, now I'm not gonna hook up a separate LED because on the, on the, um, on the circuitry itself, Jeff has got a power LED and a train detection LED. And I have the same thing. Now I use both blue um, LEDs and, and you might be able to see them. So here's the powered LED lit up and down here is the train one. And when I set the train on here, you'll see it light up. There you go. And of course it's an analog. So I'm trying to hold it and do everything all at one time. As I move current in there, see it really lights up. And so it does work. Um, it does a very good job at it from that standpoint. Um, these are some resistor wheels that I have. Uh, the downside I see to this, at least in the DCC side of it, is that if I have a caboose or something sitting in here, I'm not getting that light to light up at all. Um, there is not enough current going through these three. Um, and, and this is a 4.7K uh, uh, resistor and two 10K resistor uh, wheels. And I'm still not getting an LED lighting up here. Now, that may work better in DC. I'm going to be fair with you. Full disclosure, I have not tested this in DC. But this is what the circuit was originally designed for. And to be fair, it was back in the 1950s and they didn't typically stick surface resistors on wheels because surface resistors didn't exist in the 1950s. So it might work better in DC. The wiring is a little more complicated than my next example if you're in DCC. So that being said, I think that the next example is better for DCC people. But if you're in DC, this is not too bad. The, the, the wiring is not too bad. Jeff has this on his blog, but I just want to show you that. So you have a 12 volt power supply and then your power pack. And Jeff's got a little, it's not exactly a power pack pattern there, but it does the same thing. Um, and it, it basically, you, you, you have this broken up into multiple different detection areas. So you have your, your block selector switch, which in those days, and, and if you're doing it, is either a rotary switch for more than two uh, power packs, or it's a toggle switch if you only have two power packs. And that is working the black wire. The red wire for the detection is on, running through all the circuitry, and that's what Jeff is showing here. And then off of the power and the load, you actually get an LED, and that would go to your panel it's a little more complicated. So you end up wiring up uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven, seven, eight wires all total to wire this up, but it does work. And in DC, that's a huge plus because really other than the uh, pinpoint censoring I gave you, there's not really any other way of detecting a block and having it detect the current. Um, Typically when you're doing DC, you're not typically worried about a train stopping in the middle of a block because you're, it's much more uh, dependent on controls and you're, it's just not going to do the same thing. So that being said, this is a huge plus for the DC community. So kudos to Jeff um, designing it. Um, when I did the ambient light detector, I got those boards for about a buck 80. Um, these boards, there's a little more square inch to them, so they cost me a little more. I'm going to say um, you're going to pay between $255 to $3, depending on how many of them you order and, and those type of situations. Um, so that being said, that's what you're kind of looking at. So, but, but I included that in the $12. This whole thing assembled for me cost me $12, um, but I bought a lot, few more boards than maybe some people would have. So I'm gonna say, if you are buying this yourself, you're gonna be like 12, 1250 is what you're gonna look at for doing that in DC. If you don't do, say, you're only doing eight blocks, you're gonna be about 1250. But it is a huge plus uh, to be able to detect the whole block. So that being said, that, that's what the difference is. 
So that is DC detection for a block. It can work in DCC as I showed you. If I was wiring this up and wanting to do this in DC or DCC, I would, um, I seem to have this light definitely lights up and I might just actually run a, a, a second set of wires out of here. When I tried to do it off of the load, I did not get a good light. I'm not getting good uh, current through there. It may be my, my soldering, so I'll be the first to admit this. I only built one of these for this testing purposes. Um, so I may have, it, I'm sure that it is working because this light is lighting up. I just may not have got a good solder on the terminal. So, um, and I'm not pulling that out just to see that uh, situation. But it does work, it works well. Kudos to Jeff for designing it. And now we'll get into uh, our last and final block detector, which is like this, but will work only in DCC. The DC community, you're kind of looking at this. So hang on, and we'll come back with that. Okay, so now we come to CT coils. And uh, this particular version is from NCE. Now, the advantage of buying all these things and trying all the different uh, CT coils and all the different uh, sensor products, I have really been able to narrow down exactly what I want to do. And I'm going to say right now, this CT coil, now the disadvantage of CT coils is if you're in DC, you can't use them. But if you're in DCC, you can. And this is really a very simple product to use from NCE. Currently, the way I've got it set up, I've got 12 volt transformer coming into here. It's coming into a buckboard. I've dropped it down to five volts. It's then going through my breadboard. I've got my uh, panel light right here, which I'm going to make a little switch here. Let's flip this around just a bit so that you guys can see the LED, simple enough. Okay, so this is my analog panel. This is not wired up for, for digital right now. It's right now set up for just lighting up a light on the panel. And I've got my, power, my track power on. So one of the things that I love about this system is it is dirt simple. All I've got is my DC track feeding through here, ignore this block, that block was just to make it easy for me to do all the rewiring that I had to do in the middle of all these processes. This is my feed going to my block. Now, block detection. Um, you want to be able to detect the whole train in the whole block. So if you just pull this, let's say you have a a section of track that's 18 feet long. You probably have, if you did every three feet, you probably have six sets of drops coming down from the track going to the bus line. You really need to detect that whole bus line. So this would go from the bus line. Now, this gets into a little bit of wiring, which we'll cover in another video, but you need to wire your, your, uh, blocks independent one rail the rail that you're going to detect from and it can be either rail needs to have a break at each end of the block so it'll work but the nice thing about it this is a 10k resistor wheel set and watch my light light up i have a car in the block and you can tell and that works with my fours, four, uh, four, uh, this is a four, 4.7K ohm resistor into there. And if my locomotive is sitting into there, that light lights up full bright. In other words, this entire system is, it's digital basically on the board. It's producing, it's opening a gateway that's allowing the five volts to come straight here and light up your LED. So it doesn't matter if there's one car in there, 10 cars. If I run this train faster, I run it slower, five volts is coming to that LED. 
period. That makes it really nice for on the board. The other nice feature it has, it has a little red LED right here at the board. So if your panel is on the other side of the room and you're working with it and going, is this thing detecting? I can see right on the board that there is a train in there. And as soon as I pick it up, the light goes out and so does that light. So it's really kind of nice and a credit to NCE for, for developing this product. This is really dirt simple. Now, that takes care of analog. But let's get into digital. And maybe you're mixed. Maybe you have some analog and you have some digital. Well, if you notice, I only have only three wires coming out of here and there's a fourth wire. That fourth wire is a digital wire and that wire can feed an Arduino, it can feed NCE's mini panel, it can feed in, and that means I can also have it on JMRI. So now I can not only have an LED visible in front of me in an analog mode, but I can have it on my JMRI panel too. Quite frankly, this is by far the simplest and easiest of all the systems that I've worked on and all the ones I looked at, from RR circuits, from all the other, other products that are out there. The nice thing is on, I basically have made my decisions that all my sensors are gonna be two style of sensors. They're gonna be these NCE sensors for detecting blocks and to tell, telling where's everything else. And when I wanna pinpoint, I'm gonna use these RFIDs um, not RFIDs, I'm sorry, uh, these infrared detectors to detect where an, I want to know exactly where it's at. So an example of that, in my staging yard, I need to know if there's a train in the block. So I'll use CT coils. But on each end of the block, I will have one of these so that I can tell when the train has crossed past it is no longer fouling the thing and where I want to stop it. So I'll have on my panel lights to let us know exactly what that is. So that concludes this portion of sensors. I will get into more into the digital side of this from here. The analog is pretty simple guys. I've just shown you exactly all the different ways that you can light up an LED on a panel. And all you need to do is then just follow that, whichever choice you make, hook up these lights and LEDs and make it happen. Oh, one more thing. I want to at least go through it. This, um, all the different things. I, I told you that, that these um, infrared sensors for, for um, Arduinos, these were about a buck a piece. The um, ambient light detectors, those, when I uh, price out doing the boards and all the parts and everything like that, eight, maybe nine dollars to build, to build each sensor and they have two on to that. Uh, this one, the T is a little more, it's uh, by the time you buy the board and, the, and, and all the terminals and everything that goes in there if you want to build them just like this, this is getting close to ten or eleven dollars. This NCE you can get for about $14. So really when you take a look at all your options for four more dollars, I'm gonna get something like this, which will give me the capability of detecting the whole block. Where the ambient light and the infrareds are more pinpoint, um, they can detect the cars. And, and as I said, I'm gonna be using some of them. But all said and done, as I look at this, I really, for a few dollars and not having to wire up and do all the circuits myself, the NCE product by far, hands down, is easy. And it takes very little to wire it up. As I said, your, your biggest expense will be, okay, I've gotta have a 12 volt, I, and I have 12 volt all over my layout because I use them for all my servos. I just need to then just hook up a simple buckboard, which is $4, and I can take any area and just charge and power the whole thing with LEDs from that, that one buckboard. Um, so it's really, in the long run, after looking through this, I really like the NCE above all. Um, they are very fair priced. I'm just going to leave it at that. And the flexibility is really there to be able to do it both digitally 
and uh, analog and you can also use their mini boards and everything else to build your analog panels or to your digital panels. So that being said, I really do like this product a lot. It was fun to kind of go through all of these and check them all out. And in the next video, we'll get into hooking these up to the computer and doing a digital panel. So until next time, happy modeling.